Good evening, everybody. So we had a very inspiring lecture already. I will try to continue this inspiration. And, and the topic that I will deal with is quite uh, grappling. It's about uh, forgiveness. And two quotes. No one, not even God, can forgive what I have done to the other, except the other, him or herself, can forgive. And the second quote. A world in which forgiveness <coughs> becomes almighty will be inhuman. One line such as these arouses the curiosity of the reader. What is the target of these sharp theses? There is no doubt that Levinas intends Christianity. How should a Christian receive these reproaches? Are they justified or do they ask for rebuttal? In order to clarify matters, I first <coughs> turn to philosophy. Why should Levinas as a philosopher be interested in forgiveness? This becomes clear when we delve into the foundations of philosophy, especially phenomenology, when it comes to the description of time. Our natural attitude is probably that we consider time measured by a clock, I will here put my watch, that this is the real time, and that what we experience subjectively that is something that is just subjective. Well, Husserl and phenomenology calls this a natural attitude, but an attitude that causes <coughs> confusion. It leads, in a broader perspective, to the unjustified priority of natural sciences over hermeneutical sciences, such as history and theology. However, phenomenology teaches us that both branches of science, natural science and uh, hermeneutical science consist of a specific perspective upon reality. There is no objective world which can be reached apart from my consciousness of that world. Hence, objective cannot have the meaning of beyond our subjective perception. Speaking about time, it implies that listening to music with its flow of time, anticipating the future, retaining the past in a fleeting present, <coughs> should be considered as no less revealing than the quantitatively measured time of the clock. This brings us close to Bergson's idea of time as a continuous flux. Music suggests that time is continuous. So far so good. We will notice that Levinas emphasizes the discontinuity of time. So Levinas can be understood as phenomenologist. However, his major insight is that it is impossible to understand fundamental issues such as freedom, time, language, consciousness in an isolated subject. The I, the me, is incomprehensible without realizing that from the outset there is a thou, a you. Why language if you are alone? And what kind of freedom is it in which the other is merely an intruder or a limit of my desire to do what I want? Apparently we should redefine freedom as something that is co-inaugurated by my relation with the other and with the community at large. It is striking that time as well cannot be described in an isolated subject. What we call the past is not an objectively accessible entity. It can only be reached via our consciousness. Suppose a couple has problems. Well, we hear a lot about that. Quite often leads that to conflicting interpretations of the past. You said it, no, I said that, and so on. They go to a therapist, but this will not lead to an objective knowledge of the past, because a good therapist will never claim to, to possess that he has an objective idea of the past. Hence, my relationship with the other is co-constitutive for the past as such. Interpretation and facts belong together. My interpretation of time cannot be separated from <coughs> so-called objective time. So there is no objective time behind all this, because the experiences cannot be separated from time itself. Remembrance has an ethical value, in that I remember how human relationships have determined my past. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is an act of remembrance in which I reconnect with the past, but in such a way that the other may absolve me from that past. The other gives absolution and loses the burden which until then rested upon my shoulders. Here's a paradox. Only by remembering the past, I can be released from that past. 
but I prefer to ignore it. The burden of the past remains an obstacle between me and the other. I hear that it's time. Okay. <laughs> Hence, time is not an abstraction, but a lived experience in which a relationship between me and the other is indispensable. To put it bluntly, the time that is the other. Now we can understand why Levinas emphasizes so strongly that only the other can forgive me. If a religion could release me from that burden without the other, then the other is excluded and remains stuck with his woundedness. The alibi of a good conscience cannot be provided by religion, but should be solicited from the other. Saying it otherwise, the way to God goes via my neighbor, not directly to God and the exclusion of the neighbor. And this is why Levinas, especially in his earlier work, strongly polemicizes against participatory relationship. He prefers to think that subjects are separated from each other and from God, and this enables a mature attitude of responsibility instead of a mystical fusion in which the other human being threatens to disappear. Of course, one should realize that Levinas is from Lithuania and is strongly influenced by rational Talmudic study, which was usual uh, among the Midnagdim. And Levinas has no affinity with mystical participatory approach of the Hasidim. In a way, he reproaches Christianity, what he reproaches Hasidic uh, uh, realm. Miracles as a means to persuade another and mystical authority of the rebels are not part and parcel of Levinas' stance within Judaism. There is that famous debate, everybody knows it, but they just will refer shortly. Uh, Rabbi Yosha and Rabbi Eliezer, they, re, they discuss a certain thing. And Rabbi Eliezer invokes all kinds of miracles, a river that goes to the other side. And then Rabbi Yosha said, well, sorry, a uh, river is no uh, proof. And, and then in the end, Rabbi Eliezer says, well, right, right, voice from heaven will prove it. And there is a voice who says, it is according to Rabbi Eliezer. And the Rabbi Yosho stands up and says, it's not in heaven. And he quotes there, of course, the Bible again, and it's in the hand of human beings. So even charismatic inspiration cannot rob my, my uh, responsibility. Forgiveness. I want to do if the other does not want to forgive. Or when the victim has died. Is there no forgiveness at all for the perpetrator? These questions are complex. For Levinas, the question became acute in the early 60s when the issue of how to behave towards post-war -war Germany came up. And of course, especially the issue of how should a philosopher like Heidegger be judged, who never has shown that he has understood his moral mistakes, by becoming a member of the Nazi party. Granting forgiveness at the expense of the victims seems an ethical sin. To put it in a more philosophical vein, pretending to forgive even in the name of God what I have perpetrated against my neighbor does not only violate my integrity as a subject, but even more the integrity of the other. So it's not a subject that protests against this totalizing pretension of universal forgiveness, it is the other human being. The difference between me and the other is the most essential intuition of the whole philosophy and also of the Talmudic commentaries of Levinas. Without that, it's only anthropology, but uh, this is the essence, the difference between me and the other, which is quite difficult to understand, because the other can also say, well, I am the me and you are the other. So, about what do we talk? About forgiveness, people who genuinely repent should be offered a new chance, even when the victim is no longer there. Apparently the community has its role to play, on behalf of both the victim and the perpetrator. In a way, Christianity may claim that such forgiveness is the prerogative of the Christian community. On behalf of God, the Church may announce forgiveness. But is it really forgiveness of all guilt? If we suppose that guilt has a dual structure, sin against God, and against my fellow human being. Then we might interpret the absolution by the Church, the clearance of guilt between man and God. But then the burden between me and my neighbor still asks for clearing. In other words, being forgiven by God prepares one for the <coughs> indispensable work of asking forgiveness to the other. Acceptance by God makes forgiving the other even more acute and gives also the strength to do it.
However, seen from the perspective of the perpetrator, being forgiven by God does not replace forgiveness by the other. For those who are familiar with Latin, contritio cordis, confessio oris, satisfaction operis, that means uh, uh, remorse in the heart, saying it by mouth and be satisfied by deeds, is an important triad in which the satisfaction operis, the doing by deeds, should not be limited to ritual penitence, but should include offering compensation and reconciliation to the victim. So I assume that when forgiveness becomes an ecclesiastical automatism, the reproach of Levinas to Christianity is justified. We may consider this criticism prophetic, not meant to reject Christian altogether, but to remind him of the essence of ethical religion. Forgiveness that creates a good conscience at the expense of the victims remains the target of prophetic criticism, and justly so. Levinas assumes that Christianity, at least in the 1950s in France, promotes a kind of participation of subjects in a general mystical whole without emphasizing the paramount importance of the responsibility towards the other. On the other hand, we know that the Gospel warns us to leave our sacrifice at the altar in the temple if we remember that we did something between me and my neighbor. First settle that account and then return to bring your sacrifice. And this is, of course, quite similar to the concept of the Day of Atonement, which only brings forgiveness for sins between man and God, but not between man and his neighbor, unless he has first settled the matter in the days before. Hence, this is no invention by Levinas, but a teaching of nearly 2,000 years ago. And maybe you know that funny story about two Jews who meet each other and have the whole year a fight, and they meet each other just before Yom Kippur, and the one said, you know, I wish you the same as what you wish to me. And the other said, why, why do you start to quarrel again? <laughs> okay, um, I come to uh, an illustration of this whole thing. Um, but before I want to turn to a Talmudic story to see how Levinas deals with it, I would refer to an ethical dilemma which we have seen in South Africa some years ago. There was a truth committee who was convinced, rightly I think, that society has only then a future if the crimes have been made public and if there has been some reconciliation between the criminals and the victims. However, the committee also emphasized the importance of reconciliation, but more or less at the expense of the victim. Maybe you remember that there was the, the mother of a boy, the boy was killed and she was confronted with the murderer and you could see that she was <coughs> totally unconvinced that the, the man had really regrets but there was a kind of public pressure on it. Was it a kind of violence against a mother or is it legitimate or even necessary to enable a new future for society? Should people then remain unforgiven and perhaps full of resentment against a society that does not accept them? The dilemma is clear. Doing nothing in a society that is torn apart by violence obstructs a genuine, livable future. However, promoting reconciliation by force may ruin interhuman relationship. So religion should foster relationship by promoting full respect for the other, not by providing grace in such a way that the integrity of the other is dispensed with or ruined. Christianity may not coincide with the ruining of the other by promoting grace. But here theological reflection is needed, and in that respect, Levinas' criticism remains valid. Should the woman be encouraged to grant forgiveness? Is this a Christian concept to force people to forgive even if one is not close to the victim? Who is entitled to forgive? The biblical text that says that you have to forgive seven times, seventy times, holds only good if one is oneself the victim. It's not about others. So it's difficult to decide for someone else. On the other hand, we know that the moral <coughs> status of someone like Desmond Tutu was very important in this whole truth committee. So it's a very delicate issue and it's difficult to decide. This provides some background for the rather bizarre story from the Talmud in which I will end my lecture. In the first Talmudic lecture after the text messianique, the text messianique was my, uh, I did my dissertation on it, 
that this is the first homonic lecture after that, it is about guilt and forgiveness. About, of course, the tractate, the old mind of Kippur. There is a butcher who has a quarrel with really a giant of uh, rabbinic learning, Rav. He is one of the great teachers. And it is the day before Yom Kippur, and Rav decides to establish peace between him and the butcher. And of course, the fault is on the side of the butcher, at least that we may assume. There is another rabbi who sees Rav going to the butcher, and he says, Rav is going to kill someone. Very strange. The butcher looks, looks up, he sees Rav. Rav stands, butcher sits. He looks up. He said, what do we have to do with each other? There is nothing between us. And he continues to butcher and a small bone gets loose. In the throat he dies. Isn't that bizarre? That's what I promised. The forced reconciliation by Raf has created disaster. Raf acts from a moral superiority. The butcher had to look up. By determining the moment and the way of reconciliation, Rav is the, the winner, he is the giant, <coughs> and an ex-superior. The man, the butcher, tries to maintain his ethical integrity and dies. Perhaps a moral death because of Rav's action. The whole story is very symbolical. There is another story which also about the rabbi Rav Sera, but he is much more clever and also more uh, empathic. He knows that there are people who have to settle an account, but he walks not towards the people, but more or less like this. So everybody can say, oh, I haven't seen him, so I don't want to, I haven't seen him. Or they can say, oh, by the way, now that you are here, we have something. So it makes it less imposing. So by this acting, Rav preserves the integrity of the other. And this is a sign that even the ethical behavior of the other is part of my responsibility. I am responsible even for what the other does. And this, to conclude, time is infused with ethical obligations, with missed opportunities, but also with unique chances to re-establish relationships. The responsibility to do that is my unique obligation, and no one can take it over from me. Not even God, although he may challenge me strongly to do so. Thank you.